Hi, I'm Barbara Lucas, and welcome to The Green Room, where we explore the environmental topics that green up our world. As we all know, fossil fuels are fraught with problems. They're dirty, expensive, and limited, to name a few, and the race is on to find alternatives. Energy conservation is often called the low-hanging fruit solution because we already know how to do it, and cost-wise, it's within reach of everyone. Today, we'll be talking about a few of the many ways we can conserve energy in our homes. With us to explore the topic is Nick Hemholt of the Clean Energy Coalition in Ann Arbor. Nick, welcome to the show. Thanks for inviting me, Barbara. The Clean Energy Coalition is involved in a lot of exciting projects statewide. What is it that you do for the Clean Energy Coalition? Yeah, you're absolutely correct. We are involved in a lot of projects. Uh, my role is as a project manager to uh, work on ways to find homeowners, find energy savings in their homes to make them use less energy and be more comfortable all at the same time. And that includes audits? Correct. We, I'm, a, I'm a home energy auditor and uh, me and my coworkers go out and help people in Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti area uh, to find ways to save energy. Okay. I'm familiar with that because several years ago we filmed Sean Reed of the Clean Energy Coalition as he went about auditing and retrofitting a home here in Ann Arbor to increase its efficiency. The audit showed the home needed work in several categories, including heating, cooling, and appliances. Let's take a look at the sections of the video relating to these categories. Sean analyzed the data he collected and then gave the Williams family a report of their energy usage. Their utility bills average $4,600 a year. We're looking at knocking that down to $2,000 per savings of $2,555 a year. Where should they focus first? Their heating bills. The audit showed that almost three quarters of their energy bill was going to heating their house. Your heating costs are the biggest part of your energy consumption. And a lot of that has to do with the fact that here in Michigan, we're in primarily a heating climate. The Williams family already made it a habit to bundle up in winter, and they already had installed a programmable thermostat, which they set to lower automatically at night and during the hours they are away from home. But that wasn't enough. They still had really high heating bills. Why? The audit showed the building envelope was leaking in many places. Heat was escaping, and cold air was moving in you want to have a, uh, a thermal boundary so it's kind of similar to in the winter time when you're you're wearing your coat and your in your winter hat the blower test revealed their rim joist along the upper edge of their basement walls were like a sieve to the outside air see the cobweb this is a common place for homes to leak and this is really a great area to insulate and their basement walls had no insulation the analysis of their building envelope upstairs showed some but not enough insulation in those walls Sean recommended that they hire a company to increase the R value of their walls by drilling holes, blowing in insulation, and spackling over the holes. Sean knew that most attics don't contain the 16 inches of insulation required to prevent massive heat loss. He found the R value in their attic was only R13. By adding new insulation, it could be brought up to R45, a major improvement. He also recommended replacing the basement windows. Metal windows are pretty much the most conductive types of frames that you could have for windows. And most people these days are replacing the, the windows that they had in their basement like this with uh, glass block. After tightening up the air leaks, the next significant energy saving step was replacing their old furnace. Your, your furnace, which was pretty ancient actually, yeah. that's a huge one for you. Your yearly savings we estimated $1,000 on from improving the efficiency of that. The audit showed that the next highest energy use in their home was the category of lights and appliances. The family was already in the habit of switching off lights when they leave a room, and they already replaced a lot of their incandescence with fluorescence. But they still had high electricity bills, and Sean had several recommendations. For instance, replacing all of their incandescence except those rarely used. For light fixtures, like in your kitchen or whatever, where you have them on four or five hours every day, you'll get a very quick payback for replacing those. So here we are, we've got a compact fluorescent in the same fixture. We've taken out the 150 watt light bulb. This one's using 11 watts. It's less than a tenth of as much as the original. <laughs> Surprisingly, the appliance that used the most electricity in the Williams household was their clothes dryer, due in part to the fact that their dryer is electric, which uses more energy than a gas-powered dryer. 
Sean recommended optimizing efficiency by regular cleaning of the exhaust pipe and the lint screen, and by adjusting the setting to avoid drying clothes longer than necessary. He encouraged the use of a clothesline or dryer rack for damp clothes. Old refrigerators are notorious for wasting energy, and the Williams fridge was no exception. As you can see, we've let this run for 123 hours so far since we plugged it in. Okay. And in that time, based on your electric rates with uh, Detroit Edison, it's cost you $1.93. The benefits of replacing their old fridge with a new energy efficient one were obvious. You pay for a new fridge pretty quick. He advised them to look for a new fridge that qualifies as Energy Star approved. The government rates the efficiency of all kinds of products, including electronics, office equipment, appliances, and even building materials. Sean recommended the Energy Star website as a great resource for getting product information before shopping. Sean noticed that many electric devices were plugged in when not in use in the Williams home. Studies estimate that 75% of the energy to power electronics is used when the product is turned off. This is called phantom or vampire draw. Sean recommended unplugging chargers and using power strips as a convenient way to completely turn off computers and entertainment systems when not in use. Sean also analyzed the air conditioning use of the Williams home. He found their cooling costs to be fairly moderate, probably because they used their programmable thermostat to keep their air conditioning from running when not needed. Their AC unit is in pretty good shape, and they have lots of trees planted on the east and west sides of their home, shading their windows and their air conditioner. The most exposed parts of the house are on the east and west. Later in the day, they're going to be getting a lot here on their, on their western side, but not as much as they might if they didn't have these trees here, which are pretty beneficial. Ceiling fans take a lot less electricity to achieve the same amount of cooling. Sean also recommended drawing the shades during the day to keep out the hot summer sun. Nick, before the show you mentioned that when you think about energy conservation, you like to think about the home as a system. What did you mean by that? Yeah, so we think of homes as consisting of three major parts. The shell, the systems, and the occupant's uh, decisions or behaviors. Um, so I'll briefly describe them. Uh, the, the shell is like the walls, the ceiling, the foundation. It's all of the, the parts of the, the building that, that keep heat inside of the building and contain all of its uses. Uh, and this is where we're thinking about things like insulation and, and how tight the house is and how much air can escape out of the house. The systems are things such as the uh, furnace, uh, air conditioner, other uh, items in the house that use energy like appliances and lighting. Okay. And then, uh, then all the rest of it is decided by you know, the homeowners or the, the occupants of the house who make decisions about what to do with those systems and the shell of the house. Their behaviors. Correct. It, it's kind of like if you were to sleep with your window open, it wouldn't matter how much insulation you had in your house because the shell wouldn't be uh, airtight. So. Exactly. Yeah. Well, let's do talk about the shell. Uh, the first thing that uh, we tend to think about is the attic because I've heard a million times that uh, people's homes in America aren't usually uh, fully insulated in their attics because um, the air goes up through the roof, hot air rises, and we all need to be insulating our attics more. So what are some of the things that we need to think about when we, um, that are often overlooked with attic insulation? I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, one of the key things to look at before you add attic insulation is to make sure that your attic is well sealed. Okay. And so there are lots of areas where uh, air, hot air generated from your furnace or boiler can actually escape directly into your attic. And if you haven't sealed those up before adding insulation, it can be really tough to find those again. So we encourage people who are thinking about doing attic insulation to go ahead and, and work on the air sealing component at the same time so that they, they don't miss that opportunity. I've heard that hatches are a place where a lot of air escapes. Almost every house we go into uh, can use better, better air sealing around the attic hatch. Uh, it's a relatively easy job to do, but um, we find that it's a common area where people can make a big improvement. Do you need special tools or equipment? Or? Not particularly. It's essentially just attaching some insulation to the attic hatch and making sure there's a, wet, there's a strong, tight fit, sort of like your refrigerator door with the gasket so that it closes tightly. And what about attic fans, um, those whole house fans? Are those are a problem? Those can be a problem. Uh, we find that a lot of homes that have those uh, 
experience uh, air leakage right through the fan during the winter so that the hot air generated from a furnace can actually escape into the attic where you don't really have any need for it. Mm -hmm. So what can you do? You can build a, a, a box or some sort of a, a structure to contain the fan. Uh, either you can do it or a, there are many contractors out there who are familiar with that type of work. I've also heard that ventilation in attics is a big problem. It's absolutely essential. Uh, make, a contractor can do the work to tell you uh, how much ventilation needs to be added to the attic to make sure that it's well ventilated mm -hmm. and it will improve the durability of your roof. Makes me think of when we had attic insulation put in a few years ago, the contractor told us that our um, shower fan was connected to the attic and not outletting to the outside and so mold was growing in our attic. Yeah, yeah, the shower fan can, can bring a lot of moisture into the attic and, and cause some, some serious issues. So issues like that are, are really critical and to make sure that you, you address at the same time if you're working on insulation in the attic. And another um, area I've heard is our chimneys, that the hot air rises straight up out the house. Correct, yeah. If, if, you've, got a, if you've got a fireplace, um, you know, the, the dampers on them are, are often pretty loose and, and still allow a lot of air to get by. Uh, there are some products out there such as uh, chimney balloons uh, that can help to, to block off some of that air movement while allowing you to still use your chimney. Hmm. Sounds like a pretty low-tech, uh, low-cost solution. Yes, it is. Very low. So you just remove it when you're going to light a fire? Exactly. Okay. That's great. Um, okay, so we talked about the shell. How about talking about the systems, the, the appliances within the home? The video mentions that we should uh, go to the energystar.gov website in order to find appliances that are rated by the government as meeting efficiency standards. Are there other websites that you like? Absolutely. Uh, there's one that I'm uh, familiar with called the Consortium for Energy Efficiency. And they uh, go even a little further than Energy Star in finding products that have uh, deeper levels of efficiency, such as dishwashers and refrigerators and clothes washers. Um, and ad in addition to that website, uh, which is really comprehensive and has a lot of detail, there's another website called top10usa.org. And that website, it, um, it really just looks at the top 10 most efficient appliances in a variety of categories. Mm -hmm. So it really helps you, you know, cut right to the chase to find what things are you know, the most efficient that are available. Sounds really useful. Mm -hmm. I found when I was shopping recently that uh, CEE website really useful. So I'm going to give the URL. It's CEE1.org. And I loved it because they have these spreadsheets of each different um, product. And you can, for instance, decide whether you want um, you can see right away on the spreadsheet whether the uh, top opening freezer or bottom opening or side-by-side -side, um, fridge configuration is more efficient. And within that category, you can quickly scan and see which ones are the most um, efficient. So I really liked that. Another thing I found when I was shopping that was kind of confusing was on the shelves in the store above the appliances, there was the Energy Star logo, but I had been doing a little research and found that it wasn't necessarily true that that particular product was Energy Star rated. So why would they be able to put that logo on? So yeah, it's a, it's a great question. Um, it's really important that you know if you're looking for appliances to, to check that your appliance or is, is certified by Energy Star. Um, it's, Energy Star also certifies whole partners, such as retailers and manufacturers. So sometimes they use the Energy Star logo to indicate that their whole company is, oh. is an uh, Energy Star partner. So it's also, that doesn't necessarily mean 100% of their products are Energy Star, just that they've, uh, they've sold enough to meet the, a certain guideline there. Oh, okay. That's good to know. So we should check our websites or our uh, smartphones to make sure. It's always, it's always safe to ask and, you know, find out for sure. Yep. Okay. Um, and aside from trying to make sure a product is Energy Star rated, what else should we look for when considering um, energy conservation? Well, there's a lot of, uh, lot of ways we can save energy with the appliances we have. Um, and if you're shopping for new appliances, another thing to think about is the size of the appliances that you need. Uh, for instance, you know, if you have uh, kids that are moving out of the house, maybe you don't need as big of a refrigerator or that freezer. So there are some, so you might have some options to sort of downsize the amount of uh, energy that you're using in that way too. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, we downsized to a smaller fridge and we started using a cooler when we have parties and we want to put beverages and salads and things in it. And so we've gotten by that way. Sounds like a great idea. Yeah, we got rid of one of our fridge, the one out in the garage. What would you recommend people do when they're uh, getting rid of an inefficient fridge? That's a really, really good question. So if anybody out there uh, has a refrigerator, there are many utility-sponsored programs to help uh, recycle working refrigerators and freezers. So I would definitely check with your utility to see um, if they have a program. And many, many of the utilities are actually paying to take the appliance away from you. Mm -hmm. So you can get money in your hand and get rid of an old uh, appliance that you no longer want. Should you give a working fridge to a charity? Or? I, would, I would discourage it. Um, if, it's, if it's working and you, and you don't want it, it's probably, it's probably better to uh, recycle it. Um, you know, it's, you have to make that decision for yourself. But you know, it's it's something that if it's an old refrigerator and it's still working, um, probably a good good time to to get some money and recycle it right now. What would you consider an old refrigerator? Uh, generally, refrigerators that are built before 2000 have a lower efficiency standard that they they needed to meet. And certainly before 1990, if you have a refrigerator that's more than 20 years old, then it's uh, then it's definitely. Uh, inefficient. Okay, cash for clunkers kind of thing Basically. to get rid of it. Yep. Um, and the movie mentions that the family has a pretty efficient air conditioner, but Sean Reed still recommended that they use their ceiling fans. Now, why would they uh, want to do that? So, yeah, using a ceiling fan is a great way to stay cool during the summer um, without turning on the air conditioner. So, uh, you know, a little bit of air movement over your skin can make you feel very cool uh, in, without having to turn on the air conditioner. So if you have a ceiling fan, making sure that it's pointing the air down and, and it's mixing the air so that cool air is getting up off of the floor and, and keeping you cool can mm -hmm. really be an effective strategy. And I've heard that you should uh, turn it the other way in the winter. Why is that? You absolutely can. Yeah, you can, you can kind of flip it on its head and, and get it so that the ceiling fan pushes warm air from a tall ceiling down to uh, the level where people are, are moving around. Hmm. It's especially important if you have a tall ceiling. Or if you have a wood stove, I suppose. Sure. Yeah. Okay, so we've kind of covered the uh, shell and the uh, systems. Now let's talk about the behaviors that you mentioned. Um, for instance, when I go to cook, sometimes I'm confused. What should I use? My microwave, my range, or my toaster oven? What's a good rule of thumb for trying to be efficient that way? It's a good question. It's a, it's a tricky, tricky situation. Um, one of the things that we've done, and we've done some research on this in, inside of Clean Energy Coalition, is that the main, the main variable is the, the amount of time. So if you have a meal that you could prepare in a stove for 45 minutes or in your microwave for 10 minutes, you're going to save more energy by going with the microwave. Hmm. Um, okay. it, they, they use a similar amount of energy, so it's the time that is, a, is a, the variable there because you'll use it for a shorter period of time. Okay. Um, and what about induction cooktops? They're um, definitely the most efficient type of uh, uh, cooktop that I've, I've come across. Uh, they seem to use a lot less energy than electric or gas, and uh, that's a great thing. However, they seem to be pretty expensive still. Mm -hmm. When I was shopping for them, I couldn't afford it, but I did find um, these hot plates, induction hot plates, so you could just supplement. Sure, if, yeah, if you want just a single, a single burner, so to speak. Yeah, and they yeah. were very relatively inexpensive. Yep. I was surprised. Um, and what about burner size? This is another good behavior tip. You know, if you've got a big pot full of water, you know, it's okay to use that, the biggest burner or a, a big flame spread on your, on your stove. Um, if you've got a small pot or just a little, a little sauce pot, um, you know, there's no reason to use the biggest burner you know, or, the, or a full flame on your, on your stove. Mm -hmm. you can, and you'll save a bit of energy, especially if you're, if you're heating that up for a, a long period of time. And uh, putting the lid on your pots, is that important? It, it can definitely save you energy, you know. Um, if you, when you see the steam coming off of your, your pasta water, it, it's really energy that's coming off of there too. Mm -hmm. So if you keep the lid on, you're going to keep that energy closer to the, the food you want to keep hot. I guess it's like what you mentioned before, time is the, the factor that you need to worry about. So if you have the lid on, it'll heat faster. Yeah, it'll keep that energy in there and heat that water up faster. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It reminds me of this um, public service campaign they have in the UK where they were trying to convince people to quit um, filling their tea kettles when all they wanted was one cup of tea. Because I guess um, with millions of people having tea four times a day, boiling too much water, it really adds up. Yeah. <laughs> 
Um, how about dishwashing? Um, what are some tips for, well, for instance, I've heard that it's better to um, use your dishwasher than to wash by hand unless you're going to pre-wash and then you've kind of lost your savings. But I happen to have a dishwasher that doesn't clean very well, so what can I do? That's an interesting question. I would say um, there's a couple of things that we can recommend for dishwashers. First and foremost, if you're using dishwashers, make sure that you're not using the heated dry setting. Oh, really? And that's, that's a way to save energy right off the top. Okay. Um, back to your, your other concern about the dishwasher not fully cleaning, mm -hmm. um, there might be some approaches you can try, such as uh, soaking your dishes in a, in a tub of water rather than doing a full load of, of uh, dishes before putting them into the dishwasher. Okay. Just that might soak them as you get done with them. And sure. Okay. And how about clothes dry, clothes washing? Um, I've heard that cold water wash, well, in the video, it recommended cold water washing, but I've heard that it's not necessarily uh, very popular in the U.S. The, yeah, this was interesting. Uh, there was a recent article that came out uh, about how it's, it's really failed to catch on in a lot of places, um, but all of the science behind it is very strong, and, and the cold, cold water washes uh, ten, have to have been shown to clean just as well as the hot water detergents. Hmm. I read that I guess uh, if you go from hot water to warm water you cut your energy use in half and that surprises me that more people aren't doing that already because hot water I guess is really tough on the clothes anyway. That's what they say. Yeah. Yeah. And with the high efficiency uh, washers, you're um, not supposed to use the regular detergents. So when I switched, I had this thing of high efficiency, uh, excuse me, of cold water wash detergent. So I called Tide and I said, I can't find your um, detergent for high efficiency that's made for cold water. And they told me, interestingly, that um, they do make it, but that not all grocers offer it, and that I should ask my grocer to offer it if I want it, because they only stock what they think people want. So I guess. Yeah, I mean, if, if you're interested in energy efficiency and, and saving, saving energy, that's a great place to start and, and ask you know, your retailers to see if you can get that in place. Okay. And washing full loads, that's another pet peeve of mine because I had some uh, college students staying with me and I found that they were each washing uh, like a small load every day or two until I pointed out the amount of uh, energy, electricity, and hot water they were using. Yeah, yeah, definitely doing a full load will, will save you energy. It's, it's a lot less work on your hot water heater and it's a lot less electricity in the long run. The movie mentions phantom draw, and that's something that I can imagine is becoming more and more of a problem as we um, have more and more things plugged in. How can we tell if something that's plugged in is drawing energy, even if we're not using it? That's a great question. Uh, one of the things that you can do around your house is just go around and feel uh, the things that are plugged in. If they feel warm to the touch, that'll base, that's a great sign that it's probably using energy right then. Um, we have some other devices we can use to actually detect that and measure it, but if you're just trying to get a sense of it, that's, that's a great first step. Yeah, when I learned that, I went around my house and I was really surprised by the amount of things that were hot to the touch. For instance, my electric toothbrush, and I realized I don't need this plugged in night and day. I just need to charge it up once in a while. When it beeps, it means it needs to be charged. So I unplugged that. I also realized that there's a lot of um, uh, electric um, clocks in my house that don't need to be plugged in. My kids moved out, so now I've unplugged those, and then when they come to town, I plug them back in. But um, if we don't want to be plugging in and out, what can we do? There are there's a couple of different ways we can approach it. Uh, one of the things we recommend are plug strips, and uh, a lot of people have these in their homes already. Uh, these are the, the strips of multiple plugs, and they've got the switch on the end. When you hit that switch, it's effectively like unplugging all of the things that are plugged into it. It really closes that circuit. So you'll, you'll start saving energy as soon as you hit that switch. Mm -hmm. What parts of the house would you recommend using those the most? There are two areas that we typically look for. One is a home entertainment system where you'll have typically a TV, you know, some stereo equipment, DVD player, gaming systems, things of that nature, and lots of things that are all plugged in in, in the same area. And when you're not using it, they, almost all of those have a, have a phantom draw where they're using energy. So hitting the plug strip there can save energy. The other area is a home office. So if you have printer, scanner, computer equipment all uh, in a single area, that's another spot to look for.
Speaking of entertainment systems, uh, we saw this article last summer. You and I were talking about it because it was just amazing in the New York Times talking about cable boxes. And they said that cable boxes consume three billion in electricity per year in the U.S. and that this, they're the single largest electricity drain in many American homes, which is mind-boggling. Yeah, it absolutely is. What can we do about that? Uh, well, there's a few things you can do about it. Uh, I would say the first thing right off the bat is that if you're deciding between one cable box and two um, in your house, maybe there's a way you could, you know, make an energy-saving argument to have only one. Good point. Uh, the other thing is to, um, to uh, keep an eye out because uh, I've heard that there will be some uh, cable boxes that are coming out that will use less energy and have the ability to, to save your settings even after they get unplugged. So that's something to keep your eye out for, but I've heard they're not available yet. Hmm. In the article, it said that they are available in Europe, but the U.S. people haven't been asking for them, so I guess we need to ask for them. Right. All right, so um, how can people get an audit? That's a very good question. Uh, so in Michigan, there's a great website called uh, michigansaves.org, and on that website, there is a link to the, their home energy loan page and their authorized contractor list. On that list, uh, you can sort it out by county, and it's got all of the home energy professionals throughout the state. Um, in addition, Clean Energy Coalition performs home energy assessments in the Ann Arbor, Ypsilanti area and the surrounding communities. So if you're interested in, in that service, we can definitely help you out. Okay. And about what's the range for the cost of an audit? Uh, for a typical uh, energy audit, I would expect to pay between $300 and $600. Uh, there are other services that can be added on to that. And uh, you might want to check with uh, the professionals in your area to see what those are. Yeah, I've had one of those audits, and it's really money well spent. It's very interesting. You learn a lot about your house. Nick, thank you so much for being here with us today. We've really learned a lot. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. We've provided links to resources relevant to today's show on our webpage at ewashtenaworg forward slash greenroom. This includes a link to watch the Home Energy Sense video in its entirety. Thanks for joining us here in the green room.